Angie, the hour is yours. Um, I know that you're going to probably leave time for questions at the end, and I'll let you talk about how you like to allow for questions during a session, you know, as you get started too. And I'm going to go ahead and mute myself, um, but all of us feel free to take yourself off of mute um, when you when you have questions, okay? Yeah, thanks, Sarah. So absolutely, thank you everyone um, for having me and thank you for being here. So at any point, if you have questions or comments throughout the presentation, it will not offend me or hurt my feelings at all if you um, unmute or put something in the chat. I hope once I start sharing, I can still see the chat. So I'll see how that goes in a minute. Um, so yeah, at any point, please just feel free to jump in. Okay? Okay. All right, so let me see if I can share. Okay, so can everyone see the PowerPoint? Yes, okay, perfect. Okay, so the first couple of slides, um, I left these in here because I just kind of want to um, point out that, you know, a lot of times we use terms in casual conversation, um, but this really truly is a diagnosis. And I know we have a lot of medical professionals here today, so I know you guys understand this. So autism really is a real diagnosis and it's not just something used casually. So um, what I pulled is just some of the, I didn't pull everything, I deleted some stuff, um, but I pulled from the DSM-5 and that's how you know autism is diagnosed from a psychologist or counselor. And I know this is a lot of verbiage, so I'm just going to hit the um, highlights, you know, the stuff in bold. So basically for autism, we're looking at deficits and social emotional um, aspects, okay? Um, the second, um, a deficit in the nonverbal communication. And then deficits in developing and maintaining and understanding relationships. So the next criteria... Uh, repetitive motor movements, um, and I was saying yesterday that I have only seen this in more severe cases of autism, but I suppose it can happen, you know, in someone who's less severe, um, but I just really have not seen that. Um, inflexible adherence to routines, we're going to get into this a little bit more, but you know, there's just not a lot of um, flexibility when things change, and we're going to talk about that more. Um, fixated interests. So years ago, I had a student who was cognitively lower functioning, but he had a fixation with um, John Kennedy. He knew all kinds of things about John Kennedy. His knowledge on John Kennedy was amazing. Um, but that was just something that he was interested in, and he knew lots and lots about it. And then a lot of times there are sensory issues and the sensory issues can be anything from like, um, like feeling cloth and material, or it could be like the lighting. It could be a number of things with sensory um, auditory with how loud it is. It, it could just be a number of things. Um, and I know like on our level, on the college level, this doesn't really matter too much, but really and truly the symptoms may or must be present in early development. Um, they may or may not be picked up at an early stage. And I think um, doctors and pediatricians are better at looking for that type of thing than maybe in the past, but it is something that must be there early on. Um, and the second thing listed here, this is really important too, that has to be clinically significant, right? So maybe some people have like a little touch of autism, that type of thing. And if it's not clinically significant um, and it impairs someone significantly, there's not going to be a diagnosis. Um, here. So with or without accompanying intellectual or cognitive impairment. So at one time, if there was a cognitive or intellectual impairment, we called it autism. And then if it did not have the intellectual impairment, we called it Asperger's. And the DSM-5 changed that a few years ago, maybe 2013, 14, don't quote me on that. Um, but with the DSM-5, that changed. And so now we don't use the term um, um, Asperger's anymore. We just say autism spectrum. So that's why we don't see that. I still get psych evals that say autism, I'm, I'm sorry, um, 
Asperger's, but you know, maybe it was done during that period while you know, we were still using the term. The other things we're not going to, oh, sorry, the language um, impairment. And again, that depends upon the severity. Okay, so in class, what what are you going to see? What are you going to notice? So here's that insistence on sameness. Um, a lot of times students on the spectrum get really upset with changes in routines. So a good example of that is years ago, I had a student on the spectrum and was in a math class. The math instructor was just like really super sick that morning, um, called in sick, asked another instructor to go in and fill in just to administer the test. No lecture. It was just a test day. And the student on the spectrum was so upset because the instructor was not there. The student was so upset that he couldn't function. The um, fill-in instructor called me and I talked to the student and then, you know, we made arrangements with the original instructor um, when he came back for the student to take the test because the student was in no shape to take that test because he was just so upset that his instructor was not there. Um, inattention, the poor organizational skills, easily distracted. Um, I think you can see that by if a student has a notebook or has a physical textbook or like a book bag, things just kind of randomly shoved in there with no order or organization whatsoever, just kind of in there. Um, poor motor um, coordination um, in that you may see that as dysgraphia, and that, that means like the handwriting might um, be hard to read. Um, the letters may look a little bit juvenile, not age appropriate, um, and again, just difficult to read. So academic difficulties, that one, again, this kind of depends upon the intellectual functioning level. So a lot of the students I've worked with in the past really did not have academic um, problems had, you know, like a three, five, four point oh, you know, something like that, that uh, cognitively, academically, absolutely fine. But sometimes you may see a little bit of that, again, just kind of depending upon the functioning level of the student. This is something that folks see quite a bit, I think, and that's usually pretty obvious, um, the impairment and in social interactions. Um, students on the spectrum may not always understand um, like unwritten social rules, things that we all know and we abide by, they may not know that. Um, jokes, sarcasm, the irony, those types of things, um, students sometimes just don't get that. Um, an example of that is, Again, years ago at another college, I had a student um, on the spectrum. He came in with his uncle and I knew his uncle because he was a student there prior and so forth. So after we talked about accommodations and that type of thing, the uncle was very complimentary of me and that type of thing. And I said, oh, quit. You're going to give me a big head. And the student on the spectrum just sort of um, looked at me and said, what's that supposed to mean? And so I am imagining in my head, in his head, he's seeing me with this head getting bigger and bigger like a balloon because he took it quite literally, very concretely. And I'm like, OK, I have to watch what I say and how I say things. So um, just being very literal and direct and to the point. But we'll get to that uh, a little bit more, too. And again, those narrow interests, again, the student who was... Um, highly interested in JFK, knows lots and lots of things about one thing. That's very, um, that's very common. And then asking repetitive questions. Um, you know, you're like, well, I just told you that, but we'll ask over and over and over just to make sure that they're understanding. Um, emotional uh, vulnerability, you may or may not see this. It just kind of depends, I think, but low self-esteem, easily overwhelmed, poor coping, um, um, poor coping skills with stressors and you know, self-critical. And again, that may or may not show up in the classroom. So here are some of the challenges that you may see in the classroom. So, you know, things that are observed, things that you will be able to see. So some students talk too little because they're very shy and reserved and um, they're not going to put themselves out there or the absolute opposite where they talk too much. They talk um, at inappropriate times and sometimes it may not always make sense when they're talking. 
misunderstanding instructions. And again, it will ask a couple of times for it to be repeated or just misunderstand totally. And it's like, oh, well, that, because again, we're talking about folks who are going to read and understand things very literally and concretely. The inflexibility, we kind of talked about that. Um, so if there are any changes that's going to catch the student off guard, the student may have a reaction to that. Um, or if you change your syllabus during the semester, that might cause a little um, distress for the student. So just a lot of inflexibility with, you know, lots of different things. Disorganization, we talked about that, just will not have all the stuff together orderly. Unusual reactions to stress. Um, we'll talk about meltdowns in a few minutes, but you know, maybe respond in a way that's just not normal for some folks. And then disengagement rather than seeking help. And you know, we see that with a lot of students these days. Um, they may seem, you know, kind of distant and so forth. And the things that may not be readily apparent would be that anxiety and that emotional turmoil that they're feeling inside, the mental fatigue from processing. Because again, if they are processing, you know, like lights and sounds and instructions and, you know, other students talking and being in the hallway, all of those, it might be a sensory overload. And, you know, they just may be tired because they've had to process all of this information. We kind of touch on sensory issues already um, and difficulty shifting attention. So like in the classroom, um, you're doing one activity and then you switch gears and you go to a different type of activity, which of good is, is good educational practice, right? That's good teaching. Um, but making that transition may be difficult. They may need a little bit of support you know, with that transition. And I think maybe letting them know that ahead of time at the beginning of class might be a good strategy for that. And then difficulty with language, because I've had students on the spectrum who tell me that they're not very articulate. To me, they are. Um, and again, not all students, but a lot of students I've worked with, um, but they don't think they're very good at articulating their thoughts and feelings. So I think this is interesting when you start looking at strengths. So the first column there is what other people see in them and then the others, you know, some research that what they report about themselves. So um, plain, honest, direct speech, um, that's pretty obvious. I think when you talk to someone on the spectrum, I personally can appreciate that. I like it when people are very direct and honest with me. Um, some people may interpret this as being rude um, because it's just straight to the point. On Tuesday, I was talking with a student. Um, he just kind of plopped down and was talking to me. And then when he was done with the conversation, he just got up and said, bye and left. To me, we were still in the middle of a conversation, but he was done and he just got up and said bye and left. I understand that that's the way he is. It did not offend me. I did not think that was rude, but some people may perceive that as being rude. Sincere curiosity. And um, Sarah, do you want to share what you shared yesterday? Because I thought that was really good. Sure. So I was just uh relating back to an experience I had with an, a student early in the semester had already divulged that he was on the autism spectrum and um, was just starting to ask me questions to get to know me better. But he had a, he had a harder time understanding like what was appropriate and what wasn't appropriate. So he was asking me questions about my personal life. You know, was I married? Did I have children? And I said, Hey, I can, I, it's clear you're wanting to, to get to know me. That's great. I'm looking forward to working with you. These are things we generally don't ask professors. Um, you know, it's not really professionally appropriate. And, and he was like, Oh, okay. Thank you. You know, he appreciated that direct communication. Yeah. And like setting those boundaries and we'll get into this a little bit more too, but I think it's okay to be direct with them too. A directness with kindness I think is absolutely fine. And I don't think anyone here would ever be mean and hateful, but as long as we're um, being kind while we're being direct, I think that's okay. Because again, a lot of times they don't pick up on these social cues and we just kind of have to help them along so they can see you know, what other people may be seeing. 
Um, intense focus, we kind of talked about that a little bit. Memory, generally speaking, um, students on the spectrum have really good memory. And there have been times where they have said to me, folks have said to me, but you said X, Y, Z. And they remember exactly what I said. I'm like, no, wait a minute. Tell me, tell me when that happened and tell me that situation again. And then they do. And then it's like, oh yeah, that sounds like something I would say. Okay. Yeah, we're good. But they will remember exactly what you say. And again, very, um, very concrete and um, yeah, just very concrete understanding of what's said. Thorough specialized knowledge, we kind of talked about that. And then usually a very good vocabulary, again, especially if they're cognitively higher functioning. So the self-reported I thought was kind of neat. You can read that. Um, intellectual, again, if there's, you know, like without that cognitive um, deficit, definitely intellectual folks. Unique way of looking at the world and loyal. And it's one of those things my experience has been folks on the spectrum, once you're their person, you are their person, right? Very loyal and they trust you and that sort of thing. So those are just some of the strengths. So just a couple of other things to consider along the way. Um, again, we kind of touched on this a little bit, but um, students on the spectrum office misread or don't understand others' intentions. Sometimes they might think someone has bad intentions when they don't, or the opposite, they might think they have good intentions when they don't. And, you know, that's where I feel like um, I I feel the need to protect students when I see that type of thing happening. Um, because again, mis misunderstanding or not picking up on those social cues um, sort of add up to misreading people's intentions. And then the opposite's true. Sometimes people misread their intentions. So the example I gave, you know, having a conversation with a student, the student just in, to me in mid conversation just got up and said, okay, bye and left. The student meant no disrespect to me, was not trying to be rude. The student was done. Now with that said, um, there have been times when I've had students um, get up in middle of a conversation and start head out the door and I'm not done. I'm like, no, wait a minute, come back. I'm not done. We need to finish this conversation. I'm like, oh, okay. And I've also had students just say, are we done yet? <laughs> Again. Not, not meaning any disrespect whatsoever. It's like, yeah, I'm done. Are you done? So, you know, yeah. Okay, so this next one is something I have quite a bit experience with too. It's common for students on the spectrum to be charged with a violation of the code of conduct. So I've had this happen a few times where young women have come to me and said, there's a guy who's hanging out after class. He's waiting for me to get out. He follows me to the student center. He stares at me. He doesn't ever say anything. And it's really creeping me out. Um, so my response is always, okay, so do you know this person's name? And it's happened several times where I didn't tell the student this, but I knew exactly who they were talking about. Um, and I was able to talk to that student and just have a very direct conversation is when you stare at her, this is how she feels because they have no idea. They have no idea that she's scared. And so I just have, again, with kindness, have a very direct conversation about how someone else is perceiving their behavior. So one particular young man, when I talked to him, he just said, oh, I want to be her friend. And so I've talked to the girl a couple of times and she said, no, it's okay if he says hi to me. I just don't want him to follow me and stare at me. And so I was able to have that conversation with him um, saying, it's okay for you to say hi. How are you doing? That kind of thing. But don't stare at her. Don't follow her. That sort of thing. Because again, he didn't know. And he was okay with um, having that conversation. Again, just a little bit of kindness. We already talked about behavior being interpreted as rude. Um, in class, you may see this kind of get off topic. Um, Carol, I'm going to pick on you. Carol invited me to a class and a student um, definitely got off topic. Um, 
And so I think it's okay to like just to kind of gently bring them back and go, okay, we can talk about that after class. Right now we're talking about this. Um, and, you know, I think most of the time they're fine with that. And again, I'm generalizing, right? I'm, I can't talk about every single student situation. We kind of talked about um, many folks don't do well with change and, you know, giving them a heads up, you know, like a week before or the day before or even at the beginning of class, this is what we're going to do just to give them that time to, um, to adjust. We talked about the jokes and sarcasm. Um, don't understand that. Don't get it. And again, just very direct, plain language works best. And then this last one I know makes faculty uncomfortable um, because students on the spectrum will often tell faculty that they're on the autism spectrum right there in front of everyone. And you want to protect um, students' privacy and so forth, um, but they don't seem to have, again, they don't understand the social context. And so they don't see anything wrong with it. And wrong is not the right word here, but they don't see you know, where the harm could be. Um, but I think it's okay, again, just to go, oh, okay, thank you for telling me that. So maybe we can um, talk, you know, before class, after class, office hours, you know, whatever. So we can have a more um, in-depth but private conversation about this. Can I ask a quick question, Angie? Yes. That's different than us saying it, though. Oh, absolutely. Right. So just to clearly state, like a student self-disclosing is one thing we don't ever say that like if another student was to say why does this person act like this we don't ever get to say well because blah 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 right right and you know Sarah the thing that you know we were talking about yesterday is probably the easiest response to say is well you know if another student asked is like yeah you know what I can't talk about other students with uh with you just like I wouldn't talk to someone else about you just, you know, helping them understand that we can't do that. So common accommodations. So over the years, I've had students on the spectrum who receive no accommodations whatsoever because cognitively, academically, they were absolutely fine. They needed no accommodations. Um, but sometimes accommodations and, you know, you've been around long enough. You all know that these are very common accommodations for probably just about anything. Um, because there are only so many accommodations and there's only so much customization we can do. But extended time for tests, testing in a quiet room, separate room, the seating. Um, and a lot of times, maybe with the spectrum, it's easier to have them up close. Um, so if they get off topic, you know, just to kind of give them the signal or tap on the desk, we're like, you know what, we're going to talk about that later. Something like that, just to kind of redirect. If they're close by, it might be easier to do that. Copies of notes, written directions, clear, concise directions. And again, they still may um, ask questions about that, regardless of how clear, you know, your directions are. Okay, so how to help. So we kind of talked about this, but creating a structured classroom. Um, my personal opinion is that college students need a structured classroom as much as elementary school students. They need to know what's going to happen and what to expect. And students on the spectrum def definitely fall into that category. And again, sort somewhat related, provide advance notice of changes, you know, when possible. So that math instructor I was talking about had no idea that he was going to have to cancel class and well, not cancel class, ask another person to fill in for him because he got sick in the middle of the night and didn't feel good in the morning. Right. Had to go to the doctor. So just whenever it's possible. Um, time management. Um, so one of the things I think is common with a lot of different disabilities, students sort of misjudge how long it's going to take them to complete a task. So it's like, oh, I can read chapter five in 45 minutes, but it really takes me an hour and a half. Just kind of helping students figure out how long it's going to take and giving them strategies. It's like, oh, so why not, you know, start your timer on your phone when you start the assignment or the reading or whatever it is, and just kind of judge how long you think it's going to take and then compare that to how much it actually how long it actually takes because I think that's a big thing about um, time management just misjudging the amount of time required we talked about direct language again direct language with kindness 
I don't think you can go wrong with that. We've talked a little bit about redirecting attention and behavior. Um, one of the things, again, having some type of a um, nonverbal cue sometimes, whether it's, you know, pulling my ear or some type of a signal that you and the student, um, you know, figure out and agree upon if they start to get off topic or if they're talking too much and you need to redirect them, just giving them some type of a little cue that they need to get back on track. Um, usually students on the spectrum are rule followers and help them follow the rules. So again, if it's in your syllabus, they're gonna hold you to it. Um, and again, they might quote unquote challenge you on it, but again, not out of rudeness, just like, now wait a minute, you said X, Y, Z and they're going to need to have that explanation. Um, so help them to find other ways to react to a situation. And those are those teachable moments. You know, if someone, you know, gets, you know, I'm not talking about really upset where it disrupts the classroom. But if someone gets a little bit upset, it's like, no, wait a minute, let's kind of like refocus this and let's look at it this way. And then if they do become agitated, allow them to, you know, leave the class, calm down, and then, you know, come back when, when they're ready. All right. So, you know, talking about meltdowns, you know, kind of have a plan in advance so that you're not caught off guard. Um, that may not always be possible, but whenever you can, just kind of have some type of a plan in the back of your head. And if that's something that I can ever help with, then absolutely, um, you can you can um, talk that out with me and we'll come up with something. And for you yourself, take a deep breath, stay calm, use all those um, de-escalation de techniques that you know how to use. Um, call in for reinforcements, and by that, I don't necessarily mean campus police unless they're violent. <laughs> um, reinforcement may, may be another instructor, or maybe it's me, you know, someone else just to kind of help you. Make one person work with the student, the other person manage the classroom, right, to maintain the class. Help the student find a quiet, um, safe private area so they can take a few minutes and collect themselves. Redirect, we've kind of talked about that, you know, um, if we know that they're really interested in JFK, it's like, oh, have you read anything about JFK lately? Have you watched a documentary? Just kind of redirect that behavior. Again, this is pretty common sense type stuff, you know, speak softly, slowly, calmly, um, and that's going to bring them down a couple of notches. And then I think it's always okay to acknowledge the emotion, say, you know what, I understand that you're really upset right now. Um, and avoiding anything like reprimanding, talking about consequences or arguing because you're not going to win in that situation. In that situation, we just want to deescalate the situation and keep everyone safe and, you know, maintain classroom. So one thing at the very end of the presentation yesterday, I had a thought and I um, don't have it in the um, in the presentation, but males are more often diagnosed with um, autism spectrum disorder than females. And you one thing I've been around long enough, I can usually, especially with a male, I don't even have to hear a male student talk. I can just look at him and tell. I just know. But for females, so they're diagnosed less often. Um, and to me, it's harder for me to notice right away. I have to have a conversation with them before I can pick up on, you know, symptoms and so forth, because it pre uh, presents very differently in males and in females. So that's something I probably need to add to this. So, okay, I did a whole lot of talking. Now it's your turn. And if you want, I can stop sharing and then ask questions. Are we good with that? Yep, okay. Okay, there you are. I can see you. Terry, now. Terry asked a question in the chat. She wanted to know what happened with the kid who stares. Yes, that's the, yeah, when you approached him and told him that, what was their response? Well, sort of like what Sarah was saying. It was like, oh, really? Hmm. She's afraid? 
Hmm. I mean, I didn't say creep or anything like that, but it's like, really? She's afraid that upset her. And then he didn't know that it upset her or scared her. And of course he didn't want to scare her. That wasn't his intent. Mm -hmm. He just wanted to be friends. Yeah. So my, my experience has been really positive when I talk to students about things like this. Um, again, you know, just approach it with kindness and goodness. And I think they, they understand that. And, you know, most of the time at that point, I already have, um, they're already on my radar and I already have a relationship with them. So it's pretty easy to have those conversations. So I did have another question. I'm sorry. I don't mean to monopolize everybody. No, go ahead. Um, so I am just am making sure that we stay confidential because uh, mm -hmm. I know you're recording this. So um, if you have a student that you suspect is on the autism spectrum somehow, this happened a couple of weeks ago with someone I'm working with. And my um, question to this student was, is there perhaps something in your background that's been undiagnosed that might help us understand your behavior better? Um, I was trying to be professional and kind and, you know, um, keep boundaries in mind. So is that appropriate, number one? And number two, is there a better way to, I mean, because you would never come out and say to someone, are you autistic? Are you on the spectrum? I mean, that would be so hurtful because I, you know, in all honesty, I may be somehow on, you know, I, we just don't know. So how do you handle that? Right. So we are not allowed, like you said, we are not allowed to ask someone if they have a disability. Right. And, you know, the crazy thing is, even if you can physically see it, so if someone's in a wheelchair, for example, we're still not allowed to ask, even if it's visible. So, you know, invisible disabilities, it's a little bit trickier, right? So we are not allowed to ask that. The way I have done it, sort of like the way you said it, I voice, so let's just talk about, um, like, like a math disability or a reading disability, for example. I have just said, oh, it looks like you're really struggling in math. Have you ever had problems with math before? Mm. Right, so I kind of word it the way you did, but I actually don't even say like diagnosed or anything like that. I'm really careful about that. Um, and then, you know, if they feel led <laughs> they can disclose that but so here's the other thing even if a student has a diagnosis they don't have to tell us they do not have to disclose well i think the problem that i have and i can't speak for lindy or stephanie but you know we have students in our care that are not always under our direct observation and when they go to the OR or to wherever there are facilities where we have, you know, partnerships with people, you know, it's just, if I can use the word harrowing, to not know uh, how they are presenting, how they are reacting, how, you know, because uh, those places, the send outs, we call them, are, they just have that student for a few hours and they're trying to teach them how to be a nurse or uh, a scrub tech or a CNA, whatever. So I just find that really difficult. Um, and I guess, and just so everybody's on the same page, my intent in asking this particular student was so I could offer help. Um, not to be punitive, but you know, if there is something in your background, then it would be helpful if I knew that. So number one, I wouldn't send you out anymore um, to set you up for failure. Because that hurts people's feelings when, um, you know, they're not well received. And if I have no knowledge of this, um, that makes it really difficult for me as an instructor. <clears throat> yeah, so a couple of things. So um, as far as um, classroom performance, clinicals, I mean, anything, we're focusing on behaviors and actions, not disabilities disclosed or undisclosed, diagnosed or undiagnosed, right? We're focusing on like those behaviors and um, actions. And if they're not meeting it, then we just follow the protocol of the standard not being met, right? The other thing, we had a really good discussion yesterday about um, 
me disclosing the disability when, when I know, and I have documentation and that type of thing to faculty. So prior to coming here, I always had on my accommodation form, the student's diagnosis. The exception would be like if someone had a severe mental health issue. And we're also talking 10 years ago where I, I was really careful about that. And the student and I would always have a conversation about it. Um, because if it were me teaching, I am going to approach a student on the spectrum very differently than I am a student with a reading disability, right? Two totally different things. I'm going to approach it very, very differently. When I came here, it was not on the form. And I remember sitting there staring at it for a little bit thinking, hmm, I wonder if that's something I should add. Or maybe I just need to kind of see how things go here. So we had a pretty good discussion about that yesterday. So I kind of want to open that up and hear from you what you think about that. You're asking if we would prefer to know that? I mean, me personally, I would 100% prefer to know that. Mm -hmm. Because... Because then it's exactly what you said, it's going to change my um, interactions and my communication style. Right. I, mean, I might just be more delicate. I mean, I can't, I'm not going to treat anybody any differently. I would just be more delicate on the front end, knowing mm -hmm. that. Um, Stephanie, what are your thoughts? I'll make Stephanie talk. <laughs> I agree with you on that. As far as I would like to know ahead of time, just for conversation purposes. Well, and they just may need a little more um, onboarding slash, I don't want to use this word, but hand-holding a little bit on the front end to prepare them for stuff, and especially clinical. And mm -hmm. I think, um, Angie, as you can tell with um, three of us on here being um, clinical people, we have some big concerns right now about that. And... Um, I think that even just listening to your presentation about like not being able to handle change quickly, not being able, you know, and some of that kind of stuff. I mean, if your patient is coding and you're like, nope, that's not on my to-do list today. Like I, I, I just have serious safety concerns that how would you help that person become a clinical provider if that's not on their ability list, if that makes sense. I'm trying to say that delicately, but. Yeah, so, so right. When we start talking about like nursing and medical profession, and actually even in Carol's world, when we have students using machines where that could kill them or rip their arm off. <laughs> um, when we start talking about safety, that's a whole other level, okay? Um, but again, we're not going to focus on the disability. We're going to focus on the actions and so forth. So if someone is unsafe, then we address that. Now, the other piece of that is my hope is that maybe coaching is going to be helpful. And we use those teachable moments. Um, again, one of the things said, you know, helping students understanding, understand a situation from a different perspective. And just kind of coaches like, this is what I need for you to do. This, 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 this. Um, and my I, hope I think, is it's. And I want to say that I think we, in the two cases that I can think of most lately, we have bent over backwards slash um, been very accommodating to the point when it got to a safety concern. Mm -hmm. um, and my question more is about and I don't, I don't want to put this on you, but assume that we're doing all of those things, Angie, then where does it go? Well, like if a student's unsafe, yeah. yeah, if it's a student unsafe, what would you do with a student who doesn't have a disability, who's unsafe? Um, pull them out of clinical, put them on an action plan, some of those kind of things. There you go. Okay. Right. There you go. Um, because and I think it, our biggest struggle was lack of change related to feedback. 
from what we saw. Like okay. it would, you know, here's, we would talk to the person about here's, here's the issue here, you know, for safety purposes, you really need to be, you know, doing this, this, and this. Um, and then it would just, the behaviors would change just enough to follow the, what we're saying, but still not understanding the, the mm -hmm. overarching what we're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, what I was hearing was sort of like, you told me to do X, Y, Z, and I did X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But that deeper understanding was kind of lacking, which is really typical of what we've been talking about today. Mm -hmm. I mean, and again, I mean, if it's a point where it's unsafe, then you deal with it as a safety issue. Yeah, I know that's not a, that's not um, a good answer, and it's probably not what you want to hear, but... But, but no, Angie, I, it's, I, is it fair to say that like when you're giving corrective feedback like that, that when you're working with a student with autism, that you have to make sure you're incredibly specific yes. and even exhaustive with the directives, like where maybe you could just say to somebody dress more professionally, you would need to instead say like, you need to be wearing like these kinds of tops and these kinds of pants and these kinds of shoes. And what are your hands like? Like you have to go through everything because they will do the things that you say, but they'll only do the things that you say, right? Like if they're following directly. But in clinical, there's no way to do that. I know. But yeah. You can't write down every scenario on the, in surgery. On the action yeah. plan. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> and, and then one, oh, I apologize, Lindy. If I had known the issues, you know, and y'all, please know my heart. I was devastated that this student's feelings were so hurt that um, the student was not received well in a couple of units in the hospital. And I, it broke my heart and I wish I had known I would have not sent the student out. But, Terry, so, you, you, can't, original... you, can't, but Terry, you cannot de deny them an experience because of a diagnosis. So no, they I have been treated that. just I... like, you know, anybody else. And if we're gonna send somebody else out, we couldn't keep him or her back. I agree with that 100%. I think the difference would be, Lindy, is had I known what I know now, even without a definitive diagnosis, I would have waited until the end of the semester um, to send that student somewhere because I would have had a better feel uh, of observing, you know what I'm saying? And I would have felt better about that. And I maybe wouldn't have done it as quickly as I did. We're in these mini masters and they go really, really fast. And the opportunities are so limited. And, and you're right. I want to be fair to everybody and give them all an opportunity. Looking back, I was remiss and sending that student early on in the semester. It should have been closer to the very end. I mean, that's just my opinion. I could be wrong. I, I just, I think I wanted permission that we will hold them to the same standard we hold everyone else to. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if. Yeah, I see that for sure. That's where I'm a good rule follower, Angie. And if you tell me that that's the, the situation, that's what I'll do. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. And quite honestly, in the case that we're discussing, we don't even know if the student has this diagnosis. That's right. Not, that's, not formally. That's right. The college has no knowledge of this. That's right. I mean, it's just you guys are medical professionals. <laughs> well, and I'm actually I'm actually talking about a previous student, not even the the other one, but it's mm -hmm. um, you know, and we didn't know a diagnosis, but it still was, you know, to us medical professionals, like you said, we kind of it's obvious. But um I just I just wanted to know that that was from the school we would treat them if they're unsafe then then unsafe is unsafe and um you know you just need to document it and then if it continues you know even with intervention then that's the end of it so because um like stephanie and i were talking about this earlier we are the last line of defense before the public and if they're unsafe then i have to protect the public from a nursing student which, you know, shouldn't have to happen, but I do. And I think that's the biggest thing is making sure we remember that. That's our first, you know, and I want everybody to be a nurse, but everybody 
as you guys should know, as you do know, uh, can't be a nurse. So, mm -hmm. or shouldn't be, or a surge tech, or a surge tech. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So academic standards stay the same because even with the students that you have with extra time for test, you don't go, oh, it's okay. You can make a 65 and pass. Right. Mm -hmm. No, the academic mm -hmm. standards still the same. They just get extra time for test, but that standard remains the same. Right. Good discussion. What else? Are you, uh, could you send us the PowerPoint, Angie? I know you said you're recording it, but how could I get a copy of your PowerPoint? That was really very good. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, Sarah, are you going to attach it to the calendar invite or did yeah. you already? I can do that right now. I would love it if you don't mind. Perfect. The only other question that um, I think I've kind of heard about or talked about would be, um, when you have a, you know, clinical group and you have a few, you know, several students on a unit, um, and you cannot monitor mm -hmm. a student with some of these kind of needs as closely as you would like to, what is the college's opinion of how to handle that? Oh, I don't know if I can speak for the college or not. Um, well, you're the, you're the person. But I mean, dis I mean, disabilities, yes, for the college, I don't think I speak for the college. I can only speak from a disability, I can't even say it now, disability point of view. <laughs> <laughs> I get tongue tied. Um, I mean, so what? what is the question? Wondering like how to monitor? I, ask me that again. So like when you have a group in clinical, so at the hospital and, um, you know, you have, let's say six students on the unit, you would have you know, a couple of students with different nurses and a couple of students that you're working with and delivering meds patients and, you know, putting in a Foley over here or something like that. So there are students that are um, more independent functioning mm -hmm. at different times. Mm -hmm. um, so as the instructor, I can't give all my attention to student A. So what, how do I handle that when student A from either a disabilities and a college perspective, how do I, how do I manage student A when that's not feasible? Does that make sense? Yeah, I don't think I have a good answer for that. Um, I mean, because the bottom line is you can't, right? right? But I know with what you all do, again, there's that extra layer of like safety that's a problem. But again, also like in Spearman, they have the same issue. If they walk away and a student gets their finger caught, I mean, man, that that's a hard, I don't think I have an answer for that. I really don't. Um, because I know you don't want to leave the student so they could accidentally harm someone or harm themselves. Um, but you can't stay with them the whole entire time. I don't know. Um, are there situations like that that you've handled in the past? Yes. That doesn't mean I've done it perfectly. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know if any of us do things perfectly, right? Sarah, do you have a thought? Uh... <laughs> I mean, I think that it's like, like you were saying earlier, Lindy, I want to make sure I'm understanding your question. You're wanting to know what, what I hear you saying is <laughs> what we can do ahead of time, like what we can do when we have a student who seems to be taking more of our energy than we feel like is appropriate because we have other students. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then add then the safety component right. to that. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a great conversation for you to have with your supervisor to strategize and come up with some, and it may be that there's additional support needed. Ultimately, you won't be able to have additional support, like you said, when they get further in their clinical setting, if they can't operate with some level of independence, then you're not going to be able to, they're not going to be able to pass. I want to believe that there are students who can be coached into independence in the profession that they choose. 
suit, you know, whatever is presenting for them. Well, um, and I think it depends on their spectrum level of function. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. yeah. Um, I, yeah, I think a lot of educators are dealing with, with this even before they get to the clinical setting, right? Like if you have two or three students with different needs, it suddenly becomes like you're juggling the whole entire class session, right? So, um, well, I, know I had asked for, um, at some couple of years back, we had a student uh, who really um, had some difficulties. And, and unfortunately, the student, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, was very intelligent, um, but unable socially to be safe and interpret and process. Mm -hmm. So I had, uh, this student was on my campus over here. And uh, I am alone a lot because my cohorts are in clinical on their own days and whatever. And I had to call our previous director and ask for, and I, you know, I apologize, this is not the words I use. It's the acceptable terminology, a handler. Mm -hmm. I think we handle animals, not people, but that's the word that is used in our community as handler. And that was not... Um, available or appropriate. And so it became very, very consuming for me. And it's not, and it's because I cared. It wasn't because I didn't care. I mean, that student ended up uh, leaving the program. It just would have been a, a disaster in the field of nursing, having, you know, their feelings hurt and uh, not being able to pass them on a pair of hemostats because sometimes that in the OR, there there is a um, unfortunate, Stephanie knows what I'm talking about, but there's somebody on a gurney out in the hall waiting to get their gallbladder out, so you can't get behind. And just the unfortunate nature of, of that setup in which that individual would not be able to handle that task. Um, so anyway, I, I don't want to get off topic. I'm just saying that there doesn't appear to be the help that we need to help and it's these students, and it's not that we don't want them to be successful. We 100% want them to be successful. And it hurts me to see students sitting there sobbing um, when they've had people complain about them. I'm just, oh, gosh, y'all, I can't stand that. Well, you know, Terry, we as a college are not required to provide any um, personal assistance. So over the years, I've had a few, and usually on the spectrum, students who've had a technician. And if an outside agency is paying oh. for that, we can permit that, but the college will not pay for that. Well, could they go to clinical with the students in the hospital? Right. So that's right. That's a whole nother level, right? Would the right. clinical site permit that? So, I mean, that's a whole other science. level because of um, right. because right. of nursing, like in English or math, that's not an issue. Of that's course, the thing. technician can go in. Um, but right, when you start getting into clinicals and things like that, it gets a lot more complicated. But we are not required to do that. And we do not do that. But we would allow an outside. So I didn't know that. Thank you so much for that information. That's very helpful. Yeah, so like a VR or some other agency um, pays for a technician, then yes, we, I, I don't know about this campus, because I don't think I have, I haven't had any technicians on this campus, but previous campuses, yes, I've had technicians with students before. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Sarah, you're muted. Sorry. I'm wondering about NC Works and if we partner with them ever when we have students who may learn as they're entering into a program that that program is not going to be successful. Is That's one of our many resources here to help redirect that student. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's if those are conversations that any of you have had with your students. Like, have you, would you consider maybe looking at another career option if this is proving to be more challenging than we expected? Like, our I faculty. just think we have to be really careful with those conversations so okay. it doesn't sound like we're kicking them out of the program. Right. Mm -hmm. I have to be real careful with that. Yeah. I just know Jason Chapel mentioned when we talked last week that he, uh, that they do work with individuals with disabilities and try to help them identify the best placement, you know, for their next career option. 
I do think um, that happened in the past. Mm -hmm. But I'm thinking you have an action plan and the student's still not successful, then I think it's very appropriate at that point to refer the student to NC Works or to career counseling. Let's find something that's going to be appropriate for you. Um, but yeah, prior to that, I would just kind of be careful with that. Carol's been quiet this whole time. <laughs> it's just interesting to of be in a different dynamic to hear different situations, but go, yeah, it's kind of it when you distill it down. Um, it's still, I can apply some of those situations that I've had in my classroom um, without equipment running, thankfully. Uh, but no, it's just, there isn't a one size fits all solution. And mm -hmm. or Angie knows I hit her up very often to pick her brain and see uh, what might be the best path. So thank you for being so available, Andy. Yes. I just don't have the answers. That's the only problem. <laughs> <laughs> the world of disabilities is not black and white. No. All right. What else, y'all? I got the PowerPoint, Sarah. Thank you. I have saved them. Great. Thank you. You'll find that I updated the calendar event and I sent it notified all of you. So you should be able to see that in your email. I want to thank Angie again. Angie, you're such a tremendous resource. We really appreciate you and we appreciate your willingness to connect with us individually whenever we have questions. Um, if you know somebody who maybe works down the hall from you alongside you who could benefit from this session, please encourage them to watch the recording. Um, I will be sharing it in my Friday email. So you can you can encourage them to to click on the link and watch it. And you know this is information I think every instructor here at the college really needs to learn and and get more familiar with. So thank you again, Angie. Thanks to all of you for attending. Hope that you have a good afternoon and uh, a wonderful break for those of you heading out to spring break. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Angie. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Angie. Thank you.